Good evening. We are uh, about to get started on uh, this evening's study and uh, on the gospel according to John. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to come and join us for the study. This has been a weird day. It's been a strange week. Um, we have a lot of folks that are, that are ill, that are dealing with illness, that would normally be with us on a Wednesday, and they're not here tonight. And so I promise that when we begin our study that we would take a minute and lift them up to the Lord and ask the Lord to, deal, to heal their bodies. You know, it's hard to feel good when you feel bad. You know, it just is. And so uh, whether that's uh, a sinus issue or whatever thing is going on, it's still just difficult to deal with. And then we have some technical problems that, with our with uh, uh, computers back here, and, and, and that's always a very challenging thing. And so about 2.30, Pastor Kelly, I just asked the Lord, is this a test? And so he didn't say anything back, which means it's a test. So anyway. My goal is to get through the day with a good attitude and to honor Jesus. Amen. Hey, uh, Mandy, why don't you move over here closer where we can see you? I know. Do what? Oh, I see. I see. Yes. So you got your row going there. I see. Yeah. We all have our assigned seats, don't we? Sounds like church to me. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to be our teacher and to uh, reveal his heart to us tonight. Father, we love you. We are grateful that we can be together. We're thankful that, that every time we meet, your word declares that we're two or more gather. You're right in the midst. And so, Holy Spirit, you're welcome tonight. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you will impart truth to us, to us teach us. Uh, Lord, it's not the words of, a, of human lips. It's what the Spirit of God communicates to us and seals in our hearts. And so, Lord, teach us tonight. We thank you for the power of your word. It is uh, in incredible. And many of us have been saved for uh, decades, and yet still we are amazed at the, at the strength and power and stability of your word. It's always accurate. We're, what we're seeing right now in our, in our culture, uh, which is confusing and baffling to many, God, it was, it was foretold. What we're seeing is what, what was already spoken and, and what was revealed uh, centuries ago. And so, Lord, thank you for the power of your word tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will teach us. Holy Spirit, you have our full attention. We pray for the classes upstairs, the youth, uh, arson youth ministry, and we pray for the, st the teachers that are upstairs teaching uh, the younger students. We pray in the name of Jesus that every child and every young, young adult, God, grows in respect and, and, uh, and love and devotion to you. That's our heart's desire, is that we all grow closer and closer to you, and, and uh, Father, with each passing day. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. and amen. We, we were going to, uh, I've, I've used my iPad forever on Wednesday nights, and it, it had an issue today, so like I say, it was just one of those days, but, um, but it, it, when it's all said and done, Jesus is Lord, amen. So... We're beginning, uh, we're continuing, this is part seven of our study on, um, on the Gospel of John, and I, I pray that what we're studying, what we're learning together is, uh, is informative, is beneficial, and is helping you in your own faith journey. That's my, my hope and prayer. We always begin each week with 1 John chapter 1. It reads this way, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship, I love this, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. There's something supernatural that happens when we are in the, in the Word and we were studying the Word and when we receive uh, what the Holy Spirit wants us uh, to see and learn. And so last week we talked about eternal uh, rewards. We talked about what Jesus said about heaven. I mentioned to you last week that we were going to go, back, go this week we would talk about the other side of the judgment. And so this is heaven, hell, and eternal judgment. I'm glad you can see it. And uh, I'm using the paper notes this time. And so, uh, but uh, at any rate, this scripture, this is John chapter 9, verse 39. Jesus said this. He said, for judgment 
I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. That is a peculiar uh, and a baffling statement. Why would Jesus say that? He was speaking this word to religious uh, scholars or so, so-called that thought they were scholars. And Jesus always seemed that when those who thought they knew much were in, 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 in his presence, he always used that occasion to make them understand it's not what's between your ears that matters. It's the eyes of the heart that matter. And so when Jesus said, uh, for judgment I have come, the word judgment is the, the uh, Greek word uh, uh, diakrino, and it means basically to sever, to divide, and to analyze. And so every time that you and I are under the hearing of God's word, guess what's going on in our hearts, in our minds? God is analyzing. And so uh, n- not because he's critical, but because he wants to impart to us what we need the deepest. Can somebody say amen? I'm so thankful, so thankful that God is in charge and I'm not. Amen. John 3.16, a very famous uh, scripture that we, uh, that we know and love and cherish. I, I will never get tired of reading this. Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness. Let's read that verse together. Would you join me? Verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Keep going. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, for they have been done in God. You know, sometimes we, we think about, you know, how our culture, we've grown and we've changed, and we know most of us, do, how many of you remember the, antennas outside your house that was about 60 feet tall you had to go turn it yes had to go out there and dad would open the dad would open the window I was the turner dad would open the window and he'd say stop 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 anyway (laughs) yes and every time the wind blew you had to go back out anyway it's amazing I didn't get struck by lightning some people in my family think I did but anyway that's another story but uh, but anyway so much has changed culture's changed Technology, te- what was technology when, when, when you, Terry, when you and I were young? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I thought Captain Kangaroo, I'll just leave that alone. But anyway, that was about as high tech as we got, amen? And so uh, we have grown so in so many ways. We, we have things that we can do nowadays that are, that are astonishing. They, they blow our minds. And, and, but somebody 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago or, or further back saw that dreamed of that and worked toward that but the 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 strange thing to me is this that the more technology grows and and uh, increases its influence in our culture instead of it bringing light what's it doing it's darker it's darker it's never never been harder to to uh i i I hurt for these young parents uh today because uh my wife and i we had our hands full trying to steer our children, and th- there was some technology back in those days, but that was the dark ages compared to what, uh, to what many of you are dealing with. Amen? And so, um, and so every, everything that, that seems to have happened in, in the last several years, what has it done? It's, it's, it's increased. It's a proliferation of darkness. It has not increased the light as much as it has increased the darkness. And so we, we hate to acknowledge that, but it is the honest truth. So tonight we're going to look at this. What happens to those who aren't in Christ when they die? What happens to those who are in Christ when they die? We live in a time that is really strange. I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, Pastor Daniel, when if, if there was park football or flag football or school football, whatever, you didn't get to parade in France and get a trophy until you, unless you won something. Today, if you show up, Come on, somebody. 
you you get I mean you you know there's no such there's so competition basically died and so uh, these days everybody goes to heaven because God is just so sweet uh, I like what uh, what Pat Shatstein said when God when God stopped being a father to many but he, and he became a grandfather and any of you that are grandfathers and I'm one of them I know Bob grandfa- granddads are just sappy. Thank you for not saying amen. I, I appreciate that so much. But, you know, whatever you want, baby, whatever you, I'll get you whatever you want. And so because, you're, because their parents, you're, that's the only, only way that we can get back at our kids is to, anyway, to ruin, to ruin their kids. Amen. And so, but, but grandparents just give and give and give and know no limit. Uh-oh. I saw some finger pointing over there. That was praise report, wasn't it? Amen. And so, so pardon me. Give them some sugar. I like that. Give them some sugar and send them home with their parents. That's right. Exactly. Exactly right. You said it. You said it. You could write a book about that and sell a million copies, no doubt. But the truth and the reality is that you and I both know. You, you we all know that there is a God. That He has standards. There is a right way, there is a wrong way. And so, um, R.C. Sproul was a brilliant theologian. I don't know if you ever heard him. Ligonier uh, was the ministry that he piloted for years and years. Brilliant man. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this. He said, modern man is betting his eternal destiny that there is no final judgment. And that's, that's, that's how, that, that's the way, isn't that the way it feels right now? Do what you want. There are no consequences. You know, my father used to tell me when I, when I started driving, he was not exactly happy about it. I delayed a year because I, 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 my mom needed me to be a herder of sheep or children more than she needed me to drive. And so uh, when my dad taught me to drive, he said, Son, if you ever get a ticket, I'll take your keys and you'll never get them back. Now, you talk about somebody, and I, 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 that's all, all I needed was one threat. And I drove like a little old lady out of my neighborhood every morning. 15 miles an hour in a 20-mile-an-hour zone. Come on, somebody. All I needed was, was just, if you give me the just tell me, what, tell me what's at stake, and I'll, and I'll do what you want me to do. It seems like that no matter what, we, what God has revealed, man finds a way to get a, around it. We built a, we, we built a system of thought and, and uh, theology in our church. This is the hardest thing to say tonight. Many, many, much of the reason why our culture is the way it is is because the church has changed its game and moved the goal line. And so when God's word becomes a quote book that, uh, you know, just every once in a while we'll just, we'll just do the, you know, the, the round and round and round she goes and where she stops, that kind of thing. And, and when God's word becomes a source book for quotes and quips, and not the word of God that we must uh, abide by, then, then there are no boundaries. Is God fair? We have one vote for no. Watch this verse here. Paul writes, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. Isn't that the truth, somebody? Amen. For you, for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things or doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and, with, and long-suffering, not knowing, watch this, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse 6. Who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works 
what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Read verse 11 with me, please. Ready? For there is no partiality with God. One more time. For there is no partiality with God. You know, that doesn't matter if you that's, that's whether you're a Christian or you're not. The standard never deviates. Now, how many work with like a chemical or gases or something that the, the composition of what you're working with, there is no, you, you can't add this. No, there's a formula and you must abide by the formula. Does anybody work with anything like that? Your son? I've, I've known pharmacists over the year, years and they've told me stories uh, about slight mistakes that in some cases cost someone their life. So if, if we have a formula, if God says this is what I expect, there is no deviation. Go ahead and do it with me. Just There's no deviation. There's no deviation. You can't No, This is what God says. And Romans, Romans 2 is so crystal clear. There's no partiality with God. In other words, you don't get a participation trophy. You don't get to run around the field and act like you won just, just because you showed up. No. No, there are rules. And some people today, again, they... They paint God like an like a old fuddy-duddy grandfather. Just, he's just so enraptured with his kids that he can't say, or grandkids, he can't say no. Kevin DeYoung wrote, wrote this. He said, in some popular conceptions of the afterlife, now this is, this is very powerful. I hope this sinks in t- tonight to those who are hearing. In some popular conceptions of the afterlife, God's love gets reduced to unconditional affirmation. But in truth, God's love is always a holy love. And his heaven is an an entirely holy place. Heaven is for those who conquer, for those who overcome the temptation to abandon Jesus Christ and compromise their faith. Revelation 21, Revelation 2 and 3. But, Revelation 21, 8 goes on to say, As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all what? How many? All liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. No matter what you profess, if you show disregard for Christ by giving yourself over to sin impenitently and habitually, then heaven is not your home. Now, that sounds like a very crude and hard word, but the truth is the truth. Again, when we stand before God, you know, you, you and I, we can't wear, uh, we won't wear uh, our ribbons and, and awards, and we can't bring a, a, a trophy case with us and all the things that we got, that we were good. No, we stand before God as, a, as an open book. He will read our hearts. And so th- this is what scares me. I, I think of this when I see these children every Wednesday night and every Sunday. I grew up in a world where there were hard lines. There was a right and there was a wrong. And you did not wonder which was which. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You knew what was right. If you sacked your mother, she wouldn't lay a hand on you. Your daddy would come along and say, Wop! What was that for? Attitude adjustment. Ever chip my chin? You hit my chin. Listen. I mean, you know, some people need to get, they need, to, they need a chin adjustment every once in a while, amen? And so, because there's a right way and there's a wrong way. We don't like this because we want the, Jesus said this, broad and spacious is the path that leads to what? Destruction. So, the broad way is not the right way. Man, Revelation 21, 8, um, I, I don't think people in our culture want to read that. Would you agree with me? It's just too harsh. In Matthew 13, Jesus speaking, another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. Say that with me. An enemy. One more time out loud. An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to, then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, 
you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let's read verse 30 together. Ready? Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. I've shared this often, and I'll keep sharing it until Jesus calls me home. You can't go by what you see. The only difference between, between tares or darnel and, and genuine wheat is when they're, when, they're growing, when they're first growing and sprouting, they look exactly the same. There was a, uh, a Messianic rabbi in uh, Dallas that came and visited uh, Pastors Alliance that I was a part of in North Texas, and he was talking about the, uh, the, um, the, how hard it was to, to determine the, the fake from the genuine, and he used this parable. He said, until, until close to the harvest, close to the harvest time is when the, the crown, as he called it, of the false wheat turns dark, and the crown of the, the genuine wheat turns golden. But you don't see it until the very end. If you evaluate the whole time, you're thinking they're exactly the same. No, no, they're not. And, and that, that's why when, when Jesus, Jesus says, um, uh, wait, in this parable, wait until they grow up, and then there'll be a separation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, y'all doing all right so far? Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle writes, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found what? Faithful. But, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I'm not justified by this. Read that last line with me, please, in verse 4. Ready? But he who judges me is the Lord. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. I hope this doesn't sound like a Debbie Downer sermon. I'm just trying to show you and share with you in the Word that there will be a judgment day. There'll be no, there'll be no uh, fudging on the rules. Amen. And so, and so why, why, why is this important? Again, we live in a culture where it's all good. It doesn't matter who you marry, what you marry. If you marry, uh oh, if you marry, it, it, none of that matters. Just do what you do. What do what thou wilt. That is the whole law. That's the first verse in the Satanic Bible. Is to do what you will. So, Paul reminds us there is coming a time. Uh, verse five is so powerful. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, and each one's praise will come from God. Verse 9 continues. Let's read that, let's read that uh, verse, verses 9 through 11 together. Ready? Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Paul is saying, again, as a reminder, we, we must all, somebody say all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, does that mean for every slight mess up that we're going to this is, this is the best way I can understand this and present this. This is not necessarily about an action as much as it is a posture of the heart. When our heart is hardened and we, we condition ourselves, though we know it's wrong, we know the scripture censures it and condemns it, we, we give ourselves latitude and liberty to do something that the word condemns. That's called self-deception. Okay. That's what... That's what Paul is essentially talking about here. It's, it's not just one act, action. It's a pattern of activity. It's a pattern of decisions. And so that's why he says we make it our aim to be pleasing to him because we must all stand before him in judgment. When God reviews my record, Pastor Daniel, 
He's going to see a lot of things in there that I'm not going to be proud of. My prayer in faith is that because I live a repentant lifestyle, my wife is here tonight, she will tell you, I don't play. Me and Jesus, if, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm an open book. That's just how it is. And so I don't hide anything because my wife's got eyes in the back of her head. I know she does because my mama had eyes in the back of her head before her. Now my, my mother told Diane before she married me, well, I'll let you, I'll let you tell Diane, Diane tell you what she told her. But anyway, something, and then my grandmother, the, 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 we, got ma- we got married on a, 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 a Saturday. Was it a Saturday? I just know the date, March the 10th. Anyway, and the next morning, my grandmother knocks on the door, and she reaches into a bag, and what she had you, honey? A rolling pin. That's the honest to God truth. And she, my grandmother, who I thought loved me, said, if he ever gets out of line, whop. That was March the 11th, 1979, and I've been walking on the straight narrow ever since. Amen. Come on, talk to me, somebody. If I know what's expected of me, I will do what's expected of me. Why does God give us his word? Again, this is not a quip and quote and source book. This is the word of God. And these letters in red that we're reading tonight, they're not read on the screen, but they're read in your Bibles. Those words are of eternal value, and they hold eternal uh, consequences. Can somebody say amen? The author of Hebrews said it this way. And as it is written, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this to judgment. It is appointed. I don't believe in accidental deaths. I believe that if you're in Christ Jesus, I'm even in Christ Jesus, wave at me. Listen, you and I, if we're in Christ Jesus, we, we're not going to, we will not breathe our last breath and have our last heartbeat until God says, it's time for you to come home. Now, it may not be in the, under the best circumstances. We don't be able to understand it, but that's, that was our finish line. Glory to God. Amen? And so when, when that time comes, I thank God it's appointed us to die once. Somebody say, once. I've heard it said this way. If you're born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once. Amen. Because if you're in Christ, you only have to die one time. There won't be a second death. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm, I'm only going to die once. That excites me. Amen. Not exactly. I'm, I'm not ready for it at this moment. I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm just not expecting it at this moment. But any time that God is ready, I'm ready. So what about this? judgment thing in a recent opinion poll professing Christians were asked if they agreed with this statement I am personally certain to have eternal salvation only because only because I have confessed my sins and have accepted and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and this is what the opinion polls or the survey shows evangelicals believe that as a true statement 72 percent of them believe it which means 28% don't. Pentecostal, somebody say, that's me. 55% believe, which means 45% do not. What is up with that? Is that because we don't preach the gospel? Mm. Mainline Protestants, it gets worse. Mainline Protestants, 41% believe that's a true statement. I am personally certain to have eternal salvation only, only because... I have confessed my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. 41% say yes, 59%. In other words, 6 out of 10 don't believe that. Catholics, this is atrocious. I mean, none of us should exactly be strutting or anything because the, the numbers are all scary. 28% believe that you're only saved if you have a personal relationship with Jesus. 72% do not. Wow. Pardon? Sir? Evangelicals will be more uh, mainline who don't believe in the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit, that sort of thing. There are many, there are many, fa- many uh, names for those uh, churches, Brother Bob. Yes. But, but uh, evangelical means they still they believe there's one God manifest in three persons, they believe in the Holy Trinity. They, they're, they're biblically sound in many ways. And so, um, but anyway, I, I think of the Southern Baptists because I have very dear friends who are Baptist pastors, and they fall in that category. They would want to throw up if they saw these numbers, probably have already thrown up if they saw these numbers. So 
Here's what I, here's what I want to share with you tonight. J.I. Packer, who wrote one of the most phenomenal books. If you ever have the chance to, to, to purchase Knowing God, you need, to, you need to read it, you need to keep it in your library and read it once a year, which I do. He says the character of God is the guarantee. Somebody say guarantee. That all wrongs will be righted someday. Hallelujah. When the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed, Romans 8, uh, 3, 2, 5 arrives, retribution will be exact. And no problems of cosmic unfairness will remain to haunt us. God is the judge, so justice will be done. You know, there was a time in many nations, including ours, when justice was not for sale. I'll just leave that just, just right there. I'd, I'd love to say that's still the truth, but it's not the truth. And so, but we're not dealing with the, with the human government where people can be bought off and persuaded. We're talking about the God, the true God. Amen, somebody? Jesus gave this parable in Luke chapter 19, uh, 16. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides this, besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Wow. Wow. Some people say, well, Hell is figurative. It's, there, it's not really a place of torment. That's, that's, just, that's figurative. You know, those words in my Bible are in red. Jesus gave these words. So can we, can we vote them off the island? Can we, say, can we, can, can we pass an ordinance and say, no, that, that's symbolic, figurative language? No. Now, it is a parable, but the parable pr uh, proves something that is tangibly real. And so... In verse 23, it says, and being in torments in Hades. The word Hades, the, the Greek uh, pronunciation is uh, Hades. It means hell, grave, or the abode of the wicked. And so that place, my brother and my sister, is not for you. Can I get a witness someplace? That place is not for you. But Jesus, is, is what he's revealing to us is this. You can't, you can't th there's no way around the reality. Uh, what he says, this, this is really sad. Send, send him to my father's house. I have five brothers. You know what? The moment that we breathe our last breath on this side of heaven and we're immediately present with God, at that moment, you know what's going to be on our hearts? Beside his glory. That's the number one thing. The second thing is those we left behind. How many have brothers and sisters? How many aren't sure if they're all saved. Just keep the hand there for a second. Father, you see our hands tonight? And these hands are evidence that we have loved ones that we do not want to pass from this life until they have met you, fallen in love with you, and dedicated and given their lives to you. Father, whatever you have to do, that's a hard prayer to pray, but I'm praying it, Father. I hope my brothers and sisters are too. Father, whatever you have to do to reach them, to open their eyes to their mortality and the brevity of life, do it. 
do it, Lord, so that they will meet Jesus, confess him as Lord, and enter heaven when their days on this earth are over. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all doing all right so far? Okay. Acts 17. The bottom of page number uh, 12 on your, on your handout, my handout. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation, notice that, from one blood, every nation of men, to dwell on all the, that's why, this is why racism is so stupid. Let me go back again. He made from one blood, somebody say one blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their, pre, watch this, has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Read verse 28 with me, please. Ready? For in him we live and move and have our being. Let's, let's, try, let's try that one more time. For in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said. For we also are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Verse 30, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere. How many men? Where? Let's try it. All men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So that reveals to us that Jesus is the judge. There is one judge. His name is Jesus. Amen? And so th this confirms to us that we all have a divine appointment. I have a divine appointment. I, I think, uh, Sherry, I think me and you are right, right at the same age. Gene's a lot older. <laughs> he said this. But you know what? I've known infants that died. My wife and I have been to funerals of children, small children, teenagers. Nobody knows the day or hour. And so that's the reason why we implore people. We tell our leaders sometimes, especially those in ch children's church that, that work with the children, don't be afraid to invite them to accept Jesus as the Lord. Matter of fact, uh, a certain child whose parents are in this room tonight, every time she comes down the stairs on Wednesday night, she asks me, when is baptism? She's received Jesus as her Lord, and she wants to know when baptism is. And by the way, it's in October. And so... Uh, it's knowing Jesus, the earlier, the better. Can I get a witness someplace? How many, how many of you may have met Jesus as a child? Let me, wave at me. How old were you, Diane? Eleven. How about you, Kelly? Four or five? Wow. Sherry? Nine? Sharon? Eleven? Who else? Katie? Nine? Yes, yes. But at whatever age is is, is glorious. Amen. Amen. Paul the apostle writes this. This uh, this image grips my heart, which is why I shared it with you. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done whether good or bad. I'm looking forward to a payday. Aren't you? Did you know there's no labor, no prayer, no gift, no offering, no good deed that God did not recognize, record, 
and does not plan to remunerate. He will, he will pay us for what we have pay us back what we have done. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to be honored. For, I just, I just want. I just want to love on my daddy. Amen. But he insists on repaying us for what we have done. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter seven. Y'all doing alright so far? He says, "Enter by the narrow gate." For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few, notice that, few, who find it. Beware of false prophets. Uh Uh-oh. It's interesting that this is part of the same discussion. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes, grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears what? Good fruit. But, every, but a bad tree bears? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Then, G, then Jesus takes it a step further. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who what? Does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and and does them, and does them, say it with me, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them would be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, Jesus spoke from personal knowledge. Not because somebody coached him into it. He knew what he was saying. What about us that are going, how many plan to go to heaven? Hallelujah, somebody. Soon and very soon, we are going to I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm ready tonight. Amen? This is what, what Paul the Apostle wrote to the church in Colossae. Set your mind on things above. Would you agree with me? That's never been harder than it is in this generation. There's a bazillion thoughts flying around. If you've got a television or a radio or anything else, it's this t- tilted world thing going on all the time. He says, set your minds and keep them set on things above, not on things on the earth. For you What? died and your life is hidden with Christ in God that's powerful is it not wow in your handouts tonight is a sheet that says Jesus the righteous judge I'm not going to read it to you. I just want to point it out to you. When you get home and you have time, it's a great way to remind yourself of what the Word says because that's all this is, is Bible. What the Word says about the judgment of the righteous. There are Old Testament and New Testament verses in that. I do want to read one part from, for you. Now, the, the second paragraph is righteous judge, God is just impartial and loves those he made in his image he is so gracious can i get an amen someplace he's come through time and time again for us then the lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment second peter peter was referring to god rescuing righteous lot from the destruction of sodom if he could do that for lot he will do it for us god is righteous and knows us in the depths of our souls we can rely upon his mercy compassion and justice Many people only see God as loving, holy, and righteous. But as the creator of all that exists, he has full authority to judge sin. 
He made a way for us to escape the judgment of our sin through Christ's death on the cross. 1 John 1, 9 is our path to freedom from judgment. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah, somebody. Child of God, if you're struggling, confess your sins to your Heavenly Father. Keep short accounts with him and do not cherish sin in your heart. Rather, reject sin by the power of Jesus' name. He has made it possible for each one of us to stand justified just as if I'd never sinned and to be kept pure and holy by the power of his blood. Thank God for the cross. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Can you say amen? So, Josh McDowell said this about, about our mortality, about our humanity. This is a powerful thought. I think I shared this with you last week, but I, it's too good to leave out again. No matter how devastating our struggles, disappointments, and troubles are, they are only temporary. temporary. They are only temporary. Say it to yourself. They are only temporary. Does anybody here beside me have a flaw or a weakness in a certain area that, that keeps coming back? Lord, there's some perfect people tonight. Thank you. Thank you for giving me some coaches. Listen, when I get on the highway, my wife will tell you I'm as meek as they come. I'm sweet most of the time. I, I, I'm gentle. I, I don't have an issue. I don't get mad. Leona, you can take your hand down now. It's plenty. That's, that's long enough. But, Don, when I get on that highway and some ding, I mean, some person that drives like a demon flies by me, come on, talk to me. And all of a sudden, I get the hackles on the back of my neck stand up, and I feel a, I want to call it righteous anger, Lewis, but I can't really call it that. I just want, I just want to lighten the boat from heaven. Boom, boom gone. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? What is going on with that? No, I wasn't talking about you driving either, Lewis. It's okay. Josh McDowell says, no matter how devastating our struggles, disappointments, and troubles are, they are only temporary. Hallelujah. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, and many of you have faced things I don't even want to think about. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of your tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, the resurrection promises you a future of immeasurable good. Few people seem to realize that the resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone to a worldview that provides a perspective to all of life. Paul the Apostle says to the church in Corinth, he says, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The author of Hebrews says, If you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire into blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the words should not be spoken to them anymore, they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. That's the old covenant. Hallelujah, somebody. That's the old covenant. Look at verse 22. Are you, are you with me? But you have come. Let's read it together. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Keep going. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Thank God for grace. 
I saw a depiction once. Well, you, you've probably seen movies uh, like The Exodus and others about this mountain experience when Moses has to go up in, into the presence of God and he's, he's so fearful. You know, if you and I had to stand in these clay frames that we have, that we carry around with us, in the presence of God, it'd melt like wax. We'd be vaporized instantaneously. But we're not going this way. The Bible talks about the spirits of just men made perfect. What is that? The spirit is the real you. It's the eternal you. It's your soul. It's what God created you and how he knows you and identifies you. And so your spirit, at the moment you say yes to Jesus, is born again. Before that, it's dead. When you say yes to Jesus, that spirit is born again. And at that point in time, you become a timeless being. If all you are is born and, and you never have an experience with God, you live your whole life and you die here, you, you're, you're gone. But when we say, yeah, that's the reason why we, we, we uh, encourage people to make Jesus their Lord. Why? Because life never ends for you. Amen? And so, and, and the best thing is, Terry, when we stand before God, he sees us not as we were on planet Earth. Hallelujah. He sees us as his son, his beloved son, Christ. The same, why? Because the same righteousness that Jesus had, he put that righteousness in us. And we stand complete in Christ because of grace. Hallelujah, somebody. You know, the richest people I know on planet Earth are sitting in this room tonight. You got something that I, I know folks that don't have what you got. And I wish to goodness that they did. Because to know Jesus is the greatest privilege on the planet. Can somebody say amen? Jesus, Revelation chapter 1. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Notice this. To him who loved us and washed us, from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus speaks these words are in in quotation marks. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. How many appreciate the fact that not only did Jesus redeem us, he made us something we could never make ourselves. Watch this. Look at verse 6. And has made us what? I can't hear you. Kings and priests. Kings legislate. Priests mediate. Think about that. What's your job in eternity? We won't know till we get there, all of it. But he's made us kings and priests. Wow. Just look at your neighbor if they're close by and tell them, you're the, you're the most important person I've ever met. Just tell them. Some of y'all said, I know, I know. You know what? I'm, I'm convinced of this. There's a, there's a spirit of stupor and slumber on the church. You know why? Because we don't know the word. If we knew what God says of us and has promised us, we'd rejoice and be happier about what the word says about, than about what the world is doing. Come on, somebody. Paul the Apostle gives us this, this marvelous consolation. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means, somebody say, by no means, precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
Hallelujah. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. I love verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Many of you have buried people who beyond dear to you. They were part of your soul. You were knit to them as one, and to have that person taken from you, there's no words. But if that person was in Christ, I want to give you an assurance right now. They are more alive there than they ever thought about being alive here because they're in the presence of Jesus. And every day, every moment, every heartbeat is glory. That's why Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that's far better. Amen? Jesus spoke these words in John 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority. Watch this, verse 2. Read verse 2 with me, please. As you has given, have given him authority... And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We've got two more verses, and we're, and we're done. John chapter 4. I love this. I, I love, the Gospel of John is my favorite. I love Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not, no competition, but something about John that's just more personal and more powerful to me. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, this is the woman at the well. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Watch this. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. Stand with me, please. Jesus always had this marvelous way of just breaking it down to the simplest, most profound way to, to, to say it. John chapter 6. Jesus answered to them, them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the, of the loaves and, the fish and were filled. Remember John chapter 6? They followed him. Thousands wanted... Jesus to feed them again. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, Read it with me. This is the work of God. We believe in him whom he sent. The old timers back in the day, honey, with the nursing home, Ms. Ruth and those others that always wanted, always wanted to sing a special. If you ever go, how many have ever done nursing home ministry? It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. By the way, I'm going to mention this to you. I, I went to visit Sister Lucy Reeves yesterday and uh, spent a couple minutes with her. And one of the young ladies that goes to church here uh, is a, a CNA there, and she pulls her mask down. She says, give me a hug, Pastor Glenn. She had a mask on and said, I don't know you. Pull it down. She goes, oh! And Sister Lucy grabbed my hand. She said, will you pray with me? I said, Sister Lucy, you ready to meet Jesus? She said, I've been ready. Don't you know? Y'all know her. That's exactly what she would have said. Amen? I've been ready. And we had a great prayer that, that, in those few moments. There's nothing like believing. Mary, do you believe? Michael, do you believe? Bob, do you believe? Katie, Liana, hallelujah. Mindy, I know you believe. Sherry, do you believe? Terry, do you believe? Kelly, Daniel, Lewis, Dale, hallelujah. Sharon, Diane, Don. I didn't forget you. Kim, who else is up there? Scott and Jean. 
Lift your hand toward heaven. Yes, I do. Father, thank you. Come on, thank him with, you, with me, would you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you that the greatest privilege we could ever, ever, ever experience on this side of heaven, we've received it. We're blessed. We're beyond highly favored. We're so glad we're a part of the eternal family of God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, many of us stood a few moments ago and prayed for loved ones who don't know you. And once again, they're on our hearts. Father, we know that time is short. There's so much going on in this world right now that is absolutely crazy. We're seeing things, hearing things, sensing things we never saw before. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus for grace. Grace for our loved ones. God, that they would have an encounter with you that would change their lives so, so strongly, so undeniably that they would never look back because there's nothing in this world worth turning loose of your hand for. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray for strength for the journey. We ask you every day of our lives, Father, help us to grow deeper in love with you. Help us to cling to you with all our hearts, to cherish the love you have for us, to develop that relationship that you have with us, and to be your servants until the trumpet sounds. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless our families. Save our families. Save our families. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week. We love you.